Okay, our second uh, student presentation today is by uh, Rebecca Belisle. Uh, Becky is a PhD student in the Materials Science and Engineering Department here at Stanford. She works with uh, Professor Mike McGeehy, developing novel solar cell technologies to meet the world's need for renewable energy solutions. And today, uh, she'll be giving us a talk on understanding the role of device architecture in the success of perovskite solar cells. So let's welcome Becky. Well, thank you to the GSEP organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today. And thanks to all of you for sticking around to hear about the work that we've been doing in the McGee Group to try to better understand the role of device architecture in achieving high efficiency in perovskite solar cells. So to get started, just to motivate why we're so excited about perovskite solar cells, perovskites, and in particular methyl ammonium triiodide, which is shown in the crystal structure here on my left, has been used in the past five years with extremely high efficiency in photovoltaic devices. So introduced in 2009 with efficiency around 5%, since then, with very few chemical modifications, it's now been used in devices with over 20% efficiency. And to put that into perspective, it took other uh, thin film solar cell technologies like SIGs or cadmium telluride over 20 years to make those sorts of efficiency enhancements. So this rapid rise in efficiency has generated a lot of excitement in the field and has also generated a lot of questions. So in the community, we're interested in why these solar cells work so well, but even more than that, we want to know what can we do to push these efficiencies even higher. Now, as my title mentioned, I'm particularly interested in the role of device architecture in achieving this high efficiency. And when we say device architecture, we're really referring to everything besides the perovskite. So we like to think about solar cells as being defined by their absorber materials, but there are a variety of other semiconductors and metals that are important in achieving high efficiency. And in the case of perovskite solar cells, they have a PIN type structure meaning that around the intrinsic absorber material, there's a P-type semiconductor and an N-type semiconductor that aid in hole and electron transport, respectively. So to sort of see how that works, we can look at an energy band diagram of our most basic perovskite solar cell, where the red is our wide band gap N-type semiconductor. We have our intrinsic perovskite, and then we have a P-type semiconductor as well. For a solar cell to work well, obviously we need to absorb light and generate electrons and holes. We want to have a high current, so we want to extract these electrons and holes as efficiently as possible. And these selective contact materials, these highly doped P and N type semiconductors, aid in that. As well as extracting charges, though, we obviously want to prevent them from recombining. If we can prevent non radiative recombination, we can increase the VOC of our devices. And we want to increase efficiency, so high power, so high current, as well as high voltage are necessary. So recombination mechanisms that can happen in these devices are, of course, radiative recombination. So just an electron and hole recombining and emitting a photon. So the recombination mechanism that dominates, say, gallium arsenide technologies. But in our devices, they're made through a pretty messy process. So these are solution process, multi-crystalline thin films. So they have lots of defects in the material. And if these defects have energy states within our band gap, they can act as a trap in our material. So we can imagine a trap in the bulk of a material that could say accept an electron, and that electron may be stuck there until it recombines with a hole. So that would be a bulk trap-assisted recombination mechanism. We can also imagine other traps or defects in our devices that are particular to the surface of our material. And in that scenario, we can imagine we have a, an electron that becomes trapped at our hole transport material interface, and then recombines with a hole where there are many of them in our highly doped P-type semiconductor. What I'm going to talk about today is thinking about how the whole transport material, our P-type semiconductor, may affect these recombination mechanisms. So things you could imagine could be important when we consider recombination are things like the ionization potential of our whole transport material, which will effectively determine the energetic offset between the valence band of our perovskite and the valence band of our whole transport material. Secondly, we might consider the work function, which is going to describe how doped is our whole transport material based off of the, how close that work function is to our valence band of our, of our HTM. And the question that we asked is, if we can understand the role of doping density, our work function, and our ionization potential of our whole transport material, can we use that knowledge to come up with design rules for our perovskite solar cells? So can we come up with 
design rules that will let us optimize the efficiency of these devices even further. So to begin to answer that question, we did a series of experiments and modeling to try to get out what's happening and then what can we do to improve our situation. On the experimental side, we know that the perovskites, their properties depend upon materials processing. So we looked at doing thin film uh, characterization of materials that we made here at Stanford, as well as making devices with those perovskites and a range of whole transport materials. So whole transport materials that have varying ionization potential, varying doping density. We can then take all the information that we know and plug it into a 1D drift diffusion modeling program. So for this case, I'm using SCAPS, which is uh, a numerical modeling program which calculates the Poissons and continuity equations, giving us our relative carrier concentrations for electrons and holes throughout our perovskite device. And although we know a lot about our system, we still have a variety of unknowns. In particular, we're unsure about our defect energy and the surface recombination velocity that we have. And those two things will affect our bulk recombination, our bulk trap-assisted recombination, I should say, as well as our surface recombination, as I mentioned. So we choose those as our fit parameters, and we can generate a variety of solar cell characteristics, and then compare our modeled behavior to our empirical data that we've previously collected. We do that until we get a best fit for these two parameters, and with that, we then look outward. So we say, if we can understand what's going on in the system that we've looked at, can we then say something about what would be the optimal whole transport material? And what we find is there's actually a range of whole transport materials that we could choose from that would allow us to optimize the VOC in our devices. So beginning with the experimental side, here are three representative IV curves for three different um, whole transport materials that we've used in our study. And these are representative of the types of experiments we would have done where what we see is that by having a low ionization potential contact represented by that black curve, we have a high doping. So this is a low ionization potential, meaning that we have a large energetic offset between the valence band of our perovskite and the valence band of our whole transport material. We achieve the highest VOC we see. If we say reduce the doping density as represented by that blue curve or increase the whole transport material, uh, the ionization potential of our whole transport material, our VOC drops in either case. Now we now see if we can recreate this trend of dropping VOC as we uh, decrease doping density or increase ionization potential with our model. And what we find is we can't um, perfectly match the magnitude of the trends that we see with our experiment, but we can, uh, we can match the trends that we observe, meaning that as we uh, drop the doping density of our, of our whole transport material, or we increase the ionization potential, we see a drop in VOC in, the, uh, in both cases, as well as matching the other sort of similar trends we see in IV characteristic. And we find that we can only describe this behavior by a model which considers recombination dominated by an electron trap in the bulk of our perovskite material. So to understand why a recombination mechanism at an electron trap would be dominant in these devices and manifest in the behavior that we've seen, we can again consider energy band diagrams. So in the upper right hand corner, what you see is sort of that same picture of our simple PIN type device that I showed at the beginning of my talk. But in this case, we have an additional line, which is our green line, which is representative of our trap energy. And the things to pay attention to are our quasi-Fermi level positions of our electrons, which is that red line. And when it's above our trap energy, it means there's a high probability that all of our traps are occupied with electrons. Additionally, when that line approaches our conduction band, it means we have a high density of free electrons in our device. Conversely, when our blue line approaches the valence band in our material, we have a high density of free holes. Now, since I'm interested in particular what happens when we're changing the whole transport material on our perovskite, I'm going to be focusing our energy band diagrams at that interface. So first, we can consider our low ionization potential contact. So in this case, you see that there's an energetic offset between our valence band and our perovskite and our whole transport material. But the Fermi level for our electrons, which is that red line, is well above our trap energy at all times meaning that all of our traps in our perovskite are full of electrons. Additionally, we see that that line is approaching our conduction band as we approach our whole transport material interface, meaning that we're accumulating electrons in this device. And we're accumulating them at a region where we have tons and tons of holes, right? our highly doped P-type whole transport material. So we have increased recombination through that surface pathway. 
So in this case, we have increased surface recombination as we decrease our ionization potential any further or decrease the doping density. We can next consider a regime where we have higher ionization potential. So in this case, we no longer have that energetic offset and we're no longer accumulating electrons at our whole transport material interface. However, in this case, we still have a high probability of all our traps being filled. Our quasi-Fermi level remains above our trap energy. So in this case, our recombination is going to be determined by the number of holes we have in our device. And it turns out the number of holes we have in the bulk of our material is increased as we increase the ionization potential of our whole transport material and it's increased its doping density. We can imagine a third regime of high ionization potential and high doping where we've now injected so many holes into the device by having such high ionization potential, so many holes in our whole transport material, that we begin to start to depopulate our traps. Now in this case, we expect the VOC to again rise as our recombination is now going to be determined by the number of electrons that are in the bulk of the material, and increasing ionization potential will decrease that concentration. Now this third regime is experimentally difficult to get to, but in any case, we find that our optimal whole transport material balances between these first two recombination mechanisms, where we are balancing between a surface recombination mechanism and a bulk recombination mechanism. Now, since we're looking at this in a model, we can consider a continuum instead of three discrete points, but we can again identify the same regimes. So first on the left, when we have low ionization potential and low doping, we have accumulation of electrons and our VOC goes down. As we increase our ionization potential, increase our doping, we begin to accumulate holes in the bulk of our material, and again, our voltage drops. And we can identify a third, more extreme region where we begin to depopulate traps at very high ionization potential, very high doping. And in between this accumulation of electrons and accumulation of holes, we can identify a ridge where if you were to say choose a whole transport material whose properties exist upon that ridge, we'd be able to maximize our VOC by trading off between these two recombination mechanisms. So to conclude, the work we've done, I think, has identified a couple of things. One, in terms of advancing the knowledge of our system, sort of the perovskite that we're using and the whole transport materials available to us, we find that there are, our whole transport material allows us to choose between a bulk and surface recombination mechanism, and we can identify whole transport materials that exist along that ridge of sort of highest efficiency that we can choose and are now going to begin to implement in lab. The second thing we see, though, is that placement of that ridge is going to be dependent upon the materials properties of our perovskite. So depending on the relative intensity of, the, say, the bulk recombination mechanism, which you would imagine would be dependent upon the trap density in our film, or say the number of amount of surface that we have in our perovskite, there will be a different magnitude of those two mechanisms, bulk recombination or surface recombination. And better understanding the perovskite will allow us to better predict optimal whole transport materials in the future. And just to wrap up, I'd like to thank my advisor, Professor Mike McGee, as well as the other members of the McGee group who continue to work on perovskites and help me with all the device fabrication. So with that, I'd welcome all your questions. So I would think that uh, an important trap would be the grain boundaries in the perovskite. Is, is, is that what you're kind of thinking? Yeah, I think it's very likely that any sort of defect that we have is going to be in these grain boundaries. And there are people who have shown that the relative trap density we see in a thin film versus a single crystal differ by order of magnitude about 10 to the 6 or so. So as we increase grain size, I imagine that we'd be able to reduce the trap density significantly. But there's also, I think, some work done on adding a little excess lead iodide to the system as you, you synthesize it, which decreases uh, recombination at the grain boundaries. Yeah, so there's some, I would say, there's some work that suggests that, yeah, increasing the amount of lead iodide may actually serve as a passivant to those traps, but it appears that may not all be good news. So unfortunately, these devices also suffer from hysteresis, which is believed to be related to ion movement in the device. And it appears that having increased lead iodide, though passivating your grain boundaries, may result in excess iodide that moves through your device and result in increased hysteresis and thereby affect your performance also. Would you comment a little on the environmental? Oh, sorry, here. Oh, hi. hi. <laughs> 
Would you comment a little on the environmental and health concerns associated with perovskites, since these are quite toxic systems, as well as being water soluble, so they have a high potential for release into the environment? Yeah, so absolutely. So I think the thing you're referring to is that obviously these perovskites contain lead, and they're also a water soluble compound. So there's significant concern in sort of incorporating them at a commercial scale. Um, I think the, the sort of points about that is that there are, there are ways of encapsulation that are potentially engineering challenges that a variety of people are pursuing. And there are people pursuing this commercially in the UK. Um, so they think that they can address it and that perhaps the UK uh, you know, consumers are OK with it. Uh, the second thing is the actual amount of lead that's actually in these films. So I'm not entirely sure what the number is, but in terms of a panel of PV, the amount of lead that you would expect to be there is relatively low. Right? These are 100 nanometers of this material over a large area. So I think the idea is that potentially that there is a trade-off in terms of the energy benefit that you can get, and then also obviously concern in how do we encapsulate better, how do we make sure that no, none of this lead is leaching out, how can we manufacture them in a safe way. Did you do any work uh, to measure the carrier lifetime to relate it to the material property? Uh, yes, yeah, so we've done a lot of work looking at particularly how if we change processing conditions, we can change the carrier lifetime in our devices. So for instance, for um, the processing condition that, say, that we use for these devices, the lifetime is on the order of 60 nanoseconds, by, but by changing the processing, we can increase those lifetimes up to hundreds of nanoseconds. So what is the factor which change your carrier lifetime in your case? So if we change the carrier lifetime, it's a little complicated because you have to assume that change is somewhat, could somewhat be related to surface recombination, somewhat related to the bulk recombination. But effectively, as we turn off uh, non-radiative recombination pathways, which would increase our radiative recombination, like our, increase our PL lifetime, uh, we see all of the VOCs go up. All right, thank you so much.